What's the word, y'all? Listen, I'm just about to get back into talking about whatever the hell I want. I've been trying to be very picky with what topics we do because the numbers were doing so good. I don't care anymore because I have to talk about Lowry Markkinen. Today, I'm watching this game. I've been loving watching the Orlando Magic. They were 11-6 and in their last 17 games. Franz Wagner has been a pleasure. I've always dropped gems about Wendell Carter. Everything is going well over there in Orlando. They played against the Utah Jazz, and that's must-see TV for me. I get to see my boy Wendell Carter versus my boy Lowry Markkinen and just shed a tear because both of them is looking good. And in this game... Game, Lowry Markin had basically his his worst efficient shooting night of the season and yet he was still the best player on the court. Shout out to Franz Wagner he was amazing tonight as well but Lowry was still the, the best player on the court even though he shot like 30% from the field and and I'm still amazed at how good he's been. I still haven't even like like came to grips that he's probably going to be an all-star this season. I don't think it's going to really hit me until I'm in Salt Lake City and they announce this man's name over the intercom and his home crowd goes crazy. He's finally did it. After all of these years of us believing, he did it. But I can't say I've been a believer forever. By the time his time in Chicago ended, I believe that he was just going to be a good starter in the NBA. I didn't think that he had this next gear. And we're going to talk about what made me fall out of love with Larry Market and the prospect and what he has done to, to basically prove me wrong. Through the first month of the season, the Utah Jazz were doing amazing stuff. And I was giving them their love. I was giving them their flaps. I made that whole video about um, I, this video won't jinx them or whatever it was called. And I was dropping gems and showing love to, to Lowry. But in that video, I said, I've seen this Lowry before. And Bulls fans go remember this. 2019. February of 2019. We got a whatever game stretch in February, nine game stretch where he was amazing, averaging 26 points per game, 12 rebounds, 48% from the field, 35% from three. He was a bona fide star this month. And you know, the rest of the season, 28% shooting, 28% shooting, 35% shooting, 23% shooting. That month alone made a lot of Bulls fans who were already in love with Lowry because once your team drafts a player, you have no choice but to love them until they show you otherwise. That month for a lot of Bulls fans, was like, he's going to be the next... Everybody gonna say Dirk because he's a he's a, a form born player that plays the four that also likes to shoot threes and whatever. But but that was the best month of his career. So when I was talking about the Utah Jazz the first month of the season, I said, I've seen this Lowry before. Let's see he if he can keep it up. Ladies and gentlemen, he's kept it up and he's way better than that Lowry. Way better. This season he's averaging 24 and a half points per game, eight and a half rebounds, two assists, 52 percent from the field is so crazy, 41 percent from three. And I think I saw a graphic that said it's only him and like um, Stephen Curry that are averaging like this amount of points on this crazy efficiency. And this was something that I did not see coming for Larry Markham. When he was here in Chicago, um, his job was to sit in a corner, sit on the wing and shoot three pointers. And if he wasn't hitting the shots, he wasn't impacting the game. And I, I do want to give a lot of blame to Jim Boylan. He, he screwed up the progression of Lowry and Wendell Carter, pigeonholing them to play a certain, a certain way when the options were endless for these dudes. But for him to have a night like tonight where he shot 30% from the field and was the best player on the court blows my mind. Because what he saw today or what he did today was, was notice that his shots weren't falling. Okay, what can we do to, to still score points? He got to the lane. He got fouled. He had to shoot 37 free throws. And I don't know the exact number. He shot a total of 21 free throws tonight. 21. No, there is no version of, of Mr. Marketing that was doing that while he was in, here in Chicago. So what has changed? How do we get to the point that he's playing like an all-star after the last couple seasons? We've just seen him be a really solid role player. And I got three things written down here. There's a lot more, but these are the three things that stick out the most to me. And number one is him being used in different ways. You mentioned now when he was here in Chicago under Jim Boylan, he was basically a spot-up shooter the entirety of it. He very rarely put the ball on the floor. But guess what? When he did... A lot of the times, good things happen. You get some posters, you get some dunks, and we should have saw the writing on the wall that we should allow this man to have the ball in his hands more. He's being used as a pick and roll ball handler. He's being used as a pick and roll roller. He's taking mid range jump shots. He's using his body, his size, which is number two on my list. Because one of the things I hated most about watching Lowry in his first couple years of his career here in Chicago was like, even when he had the switches of the smaller defenders or whatever, he stood, he, he still just stood there. And nowadays, if he has a small defender on him, he will put his ass in the post and get him an easy bucket. That was that's a mind shift, a mindset shift, but it's also him feeling out of his body more. If you look at pictures of him 
as a 19 year old rookie i mean it's no surprise that at 25 years old he's he's buffered he's bigger but he's he's put on that muscle and he's using that size differently than the first couple years of his career i mean he's as efficient as can be on every single level of the court a true three level score i still have some kind of skepticism about his shooting right now because it is so otherworldly but again we're 42 games in the year so so could this just really be him when it comes to shooting even if it's not there are a few things that i know for sure will be there and that is him running like a gazelle in the transition i think when it comes to points per possessions and transition he's like in the 97th percentile with like if they're on a fast break you better find larry market because if you don't he is going to dunk on your head and when he played against the bulls last week i think he had eight dunks in a single game that's the most he's ever had in his career he is doing stuff like this over and over and over and he's impacting the game more than just sitting in the corner and shooting threes. Let's go back to talk about my Bulls fandom around Larry Market because December 28th, 2018, I tweeted, I'm so convinced that Larry will be a five to eight time all-star. Now, this is not no super hot take. I think everybody feels that way about their young players. At least that's the type of hope that you have. Actually, I wonder what he did that night specifically <laughs> for me to tweet that. Hold on, I'm going through the game log real quick. He didn't do anything. The Bulls won a basketball game, so that's fun. But in this game, he shot five for 15. He had 14 points, 14 rebounds. But something about this night made me tweet that. But I was feeling good. I was feeling great about Larry Marketing as a prospect. And I, I honestly did believe that in the moment. But by the time we got to that last year with the Chicago Bulls, it was very apparent that the partnership between Chicago and Larry Marketing had run its course. So by the time he was traded to Cleveland, it was it wasn't no like oh man we traded my boy the guy that i said was going to be a five to eight time all-star because i thought that it has run his course together and, and i think that was pretty unanimous across bulls fandom we all believed that that season was the last of larry because well he was up for a contract extension after his rookie deal we didn't know how to value him the league didn't know how to value him so much so that what do we get back? Darius Jones Jr. in a lottery protected first round pick. That was the value of Mr. Marketing. And it was a three team deal that I think Larry Nance ended up going to the Pelicans. And I vividly remember seeing that Larry Marketing was traded to the Cavs. And in my mind, I thought we were getting Larry Nance. And I was fucking hyped. I said, we getting Larry Nance for marketing? There's tweets. For, for every tweet that you see me say, oh, Larry's going to be a five to eight time All Star, there's also tweets towards the end of our relationship. That sounds crazy. Where I'm like, I'm like joking to Woj, who wants Larry marketing? You know what I'm saying? At that point, I had basically given up on him as the guy that I thought he could have been in 2018 when I was sending that tweet. And mostly it was because we weren't able to see all the things that he could do. And, and this is a conversation about development, mostly within the Chicago Bulls, because you can look throughout the history of us in our drafting and our lack of development. We do have some great success stories like Jimmy Butler drafted 30th overall, uh, D D2 school, then Marquette drafted 30th. Like we have those, but that was 67 years ago. So the whole time we were in a lottery, that five year stretch, we didn't develop anything. You can argue we, we developed Zach Levine after the Jimmy Butler trade. But I honestly believe that Zach Levine was just a hooper. You know what I'm saying? I think that that the, the, there's like a thing that they show beginning of every single Bulls game, if you're in an arena, where he talks about every single day of his life when he found the game of basketball that he's putting up thousands of shots a day. So I thought I think that the development that was Zach Levine was Zach Levine just putting in the work. But when you look at Wendell Carter, you look at Larry Marketing, you look at Chris Dunn, because we traded for Chris Dunn, you know, one year into his career. You look at all of the people that we had in, in our system, none of them really developed. We drafted Denzel Valentine. He's putting up triple doubles in the G. We drafted Patrick Williams, who I'm super optimistic about, uh, but but we haven't seen significant growth from him. And it's still early. He's still younger than majority of the people that was that was drafted over the last two seasons. We ain't sleep on you, Pat. I saw you tonight, even though we lost to OKC, which is a, a conversation in itself. So the Bulls have their own problem, but this might be a problem across the league in general. When do you know? it's time to part ways with a younger talent. Because when the Bulls traded him away, he was only 23 years old. Again, he didn't even get that second contract under the Bulls. He he genuinely played out his rookie deal and the Bulls says, see you later. So when do you know it is time to flip the switch? 
to throw somebody out. I honestly do believe that the, the front office came in here in Chicago and looked at all of the pieces that the previous front office drafted and said, hey, we want our own pieces. We want our own guys. So Lowry was under the previous regime, and we might think he's cool. We might think he's solid, but, like, we don't want to extend that dude. He's not one of our guys. So we're going to trade him away. We're going to draft Patrick Williams. We're going to draft Dalen Terry. Those are our draftees. Those are guys we want to invest in and not miss the marketer. And then when you look deeper, even his time in Cleveland, good season, you know? He only shot 35% from three, which is not great for a guy that's shooting six attempts per game. But he was he was moved over to the three position. And I vividly remember that video when they when they traded for him. I said in that video, there was no way Lowry would be able to run the three. I watched him for four years, Chicago. He was slow footed. Whenever he got a switch, he was dominated. There was no way I saw him playing the three successfully. And guess what? He was alongside Evan Mobley. He was alongside Jared Allen. And he held his own. And as, if they would have stayed healthy, they would have made the playoffs and been one of the top seeds. He played a crucial part in that. But now here we go a year later and he's traded for Donovan Mitchell. Though he doesn't play a ton of three anymore, you still see some of the things he learned while he was guarding wings all last season. All of these little things throughout the course of his career has added up to him being an all-star in this moment. And I'm extremely excited and happy for him, man. Again, I thought it was going to happen. And then I thought it wasn't going to happen. And I'm glad that it is. So, Larry, if you're watching this video, you know I'm going to be in Salt Lake City for All-Star. We'd love to chat it up, and maybe you can come into my show. I'm just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. All right. I'll see you all soon.